And welcome. We've got one half of the duo, and we may get uh, surprised by the other half, but welcome, Robert Wells. Thank you, man. How are you doing? Excellent. I, I uh, don't usually turn these into COVID talk, but you've uh, <laughs> you, you've left what you <laughs> talked about the, uh, the the safety of Southeast Asia to return home to Texas after a year away. So let's uh, let's let, let's hear that perspective. These past months in Thailand, I've I've heard they've uh, that you know, everybody had different hiccups to begin with, but overall they extended visas. They did different things. They adjusted pretty quickly for people in a situation like yourself. Yeah, I think there's a lot of kudos to go around to the to Thai government, to people who are already in pretty bad situations, uh, stranded around the world, to kind of help us make it make an informed decision and not have to scramble back to our home countries. Uh, I don't, by my count, I was on the island of Koh Samoy for, for five months and there wasn't an incredible amount of Americans there. And maybe they were hiding, but um, I know it was helpful for us to, a lot of us, it was a no brainer to, Kind of stay into the safety safety net of, of Koh Samoy in Thailand. Um, I think it started out with just just a couple months of extension, and now with, I, like uh, we arrived in March, right, late March, and they pushed uh -huh. it to late July. Um, and then like right as we pulled the trigger and decided we were going to head back home, they they pushed it to the end of September. So I know there's some people who kind of breathed out of sigh of relief. <laughs> who didn't really want to come back to America, who didn't really want to turn, like a lot, of, I have a lot of friends that in Thailand that works in the service industry. And in particular, that's been one of the, the toughest hit industries. And they were like, well, I really don't have a lot to go home to. So I hope that they hope that they do extend it. And they did. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been a, uh, to, to your point about kind of reintegrating, it's been an interesting perspective to, to leave what I, where I felt very safe. I mean, Thailand has all but eradicated COVID. I don't think there's been a, a new case that wasn't imported um, and they didn't take care of state quarantine in, in over 10 weeks now. Hmm. And I mean, for people you're, who are watching around the world in your Facebook group, they know that you can't even get into a gas station in Asia without a mask or a temperature test, like, uh, like you know, the likes of a 7-Eleven or a Family Mart. Well, it's been a it's been a stark contrast returning to the United States where I walked into the border in Chicago and there wasn't even as, as much as a survey to <laughs> fill out, let alone, you know, there are masks date signs on gas stations and restaurants but it's it seems very it seems loosely enforced at best and i know everyone's doing the best they can i know the state state governments the national the national government you know kind of has their has their power struggle on the issue but it's been uh you know texas is, is an interesting state about their their freedom we, we love our freedom here so <laughs> it's but when i try to explain to people i walk in with masks and they look at me like i have three heads I'm like it wasn't really an op it wasn't really an option in Asia, so I don't really know what else to do. <laughs> <laughs> for, for people that don't know Texas, I mean, uh, we we don't want to paint that uh, uh, you know that, that particular spirit in a, in a broad brush and negative light. Uh, we may have our views of uh, this particular situation, but but speak to the culture that that is Texas for for people sitting overseas fascinated by uh, the idea they've seen movies, TV shows, but can't, can't really, can't really uh, nail down what, what that feels like. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I it, it's tough to paint it with, with the broad brush for sure. There are pockets of, uh, uh, I would, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say pretty safely, most of rural, I hope I don't offend anybody that's from Texas, but most, most pockets of, of rural Texas are fairly, fiercely conservative and and believe that you know mask mandates as a whole are kind of a infringement of our as our, of our rights as Americans to, to do whatever we want so um, it's been I, I think I've had my own points of disappointment with America I saw them from overseas and I was kind of hoping it was just uh, a lot of stuff I was seeing on social media but unfortunately when I got back here I've, I've seen it firsthand last yesterday uh, I had got to go golfing, which is a, a great activity we can still do while we're social distancing. And I saw at a gas station, a guy absolutely tear into a gas station attendant for not letting her in or not letting him in for wearing a mask. And I was just like, man, I, I don't know what to tell you. This is, this is how it is. And so it, it's good to see, it's good to see some businesses like that actually enforcing it. But like to, that was a long way to answer your question and, and to say that Texas is, Texas is a very conservative place for the, for the most part. And, they fiercely believe in that in some parts, you know, making you wear a mask is taking away your freedom. So yeah, that's, that just is. 
Try, which I guess you try not to get too political in your interviews. So no, no, it's, no, it's perfectly fine to, to go those ways. I mean, it it is perplexing even for me as an American. This, uh, I mean, I've seen different conservative writers, but but different types of conservatives who have talked about you know, community and caring for others as something that put on a mask to be considerate of others. But it's uh, you know, once in a a debate is framed mm-hmm. in a particular way, it's it's very clearly as we've seen, very hard to, to unstick it. I, I do want to talk about Texas uh, separate of uh, separate of the current moment. Last year, I uh, took took a, a few road trips, of in and out short road trips, but say to Big Bend National Park and uh, mm-hmm. some of these, uh, I mean, it, it's a big state and it's it's even bigger than, than you expect. And it's it's the kind of state where if you didn't fill up your gas tank in some parts, you're you're going to be <laughs> yeah, waiting yeah. for trooper to, to, to fill you up because you you missed your chance. So, I, to tell us where you're located and and what your history in the state is. Yeah, um, I was I was born and raised in Texas. Um, uh, as, as for as long as I can remember, we as a teenager, I did do I did do four years in in Europe and specifically Paris. Um, um, probably as a teenager, maybe like ages thirteen to seventeen. Uh, my dad had a project, so that that was an interesting perspective. And, and moving to Europe gave me, I think, gave me kind of the, uh, the the travel bug that I had today, and ultimately took took around the world with me on our on our world trip. Um, but we are we are located in Dallas, um, may, maybe moving to Austin, so that that'll be exciting. I don't know if you made it to Austin on your travels or not, but I was Austin, Austin. Uh, had a couple of business trips about this yeah. time of year a few years ago, and even with a hat. I felt like the sun was was boring a, a hole through my hat through my head. <laughs> I said, no, oh. no, "Why August for me? I can't handle it." Well, I, luckily, I've actually, I've, I've, this is this is the dead of summer here. Uh, this or this late July, early August is is about as bad as it gets at times. And I thought I was going to come home because honestly, we were in. I don't want to jump ahead, but we were in Japan in December, and that was about the only cold we got. Mm. For the last 12 months and now we've come back and we're basically reliving summer all over again so we've uh but it's 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 been very dry very very dry heat not too terribly humid thailand thailand was far worse in terms of just humidity and feeling like we were in a, a jungle in a rainforest <laughs> but um yeah in between all my all my moves we, we briefly lived in san francisco i lived in north carolina for work but but texas has generally always been home and i am a proud texan and it is nice to be back uh, i can tell you that with with no degree of uncertainty, the hardest food in the world to replace was Mexican food, or at least specifically Tex-Mex. Uh, there was no pure there was no pure substitute for it around the world. You can find Italian, uh, <laughs> you know, Japanese, Thai. You can find all that anywhere you want around the world, and it's probably pretty high quality. But Tex-Mex food, Mexican food, tough to replace. And we tried. We looked. We ate at places, and it was just wasn't cutting it. <laughs> What's your Tex-Mex food of choice? That's clearly not going to be found in Mexico proper. <laughs> Tex-Mex food of choice. Um, there, you know, it, it's it's some form of like stuff stuffed burrito with 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 some kind of queso or sauce on top, or or just some like pure Mexican street tacos, um, elotes, stuff like that. Um, oddly enough, we we tried so many quesadillas on the road. We go to a spot that claimed to be Mexican, and it was just like. You put you put nacho cheese like you find in a can in a quesadilla, and it's just like that's that's not it. Like it's 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 you need you need pure good shredded cheese and like a lot of it. It is a quesadilla. It is just cheese. <laughs> How should a tourist visit Dallas? That I've mainly been for business trips, and it it's yeah. not the thing that's like obvious of a tourist. Like th- these are the spots and routes uh, to visit. Um, I think just th- there. If, if I had to just pick a historical aspect of Dallas, I think you should. I think you should visit the the John F. Kennedy sites in Dallas with the with the assassination. That that's somewhere I always take friends that are visiting to. Um, but there's there's just not a tremendous amount of history. Uh, I would say Dallas is, is a great place to eat and drink. So um, there there is some little sub neighborhoods like Deep Ellum, which have which has some amazing breweries and. In bars and restaurants um you know we've got great live sports um with the cowboys the or the dallas cowboys the, the texas rangers the stars and the mavericks um i would say i would say it's, it's a big sports town it's a big it's a big eating town um but you know get get your dallas history and get your dallas presidential history in as well so yeah i've been to the uh last year one of my projects was visiting the the presidential museums so i went yeah. up to uh 
the George W. Bush Museum. And uh, yeah, one, one of my tips there is, is depending on your political preferences, if you're, if you're going to be visiting several, you can buy an annual pass to one that, that you support and the prices are different too and, and uh, get in free for the others. So you can, <laughs> you can, you, you can choose your allegiance. And, uh, it, yeah. it, is, it is good for history buffs, but I, I would say the majority of my friends would like, you know, I think muse museums might bore them to tears. So uh. yeah. I'll say of, of the ones I visited and the modern ones start from uh, uh, Herbert Hoover in Iowa, that, that one, was one of the less balanced. And they're all built by foundations of supporters. So they all tell a very positive story. But for instance, the Nixon one I found in California, I found was particularly interesting because uh, almost all of the presidential museums start with like, here here he was as a boy. And, and you, you don't remember, yeah. why well, was he a football? Where the Nixon one, it started with what everybody knows, his resignation and, and, and the, the tumult around that, and then it went back in time to try to piece together what made this person that ended up there. And I, I thought that was an effective way to do it, where um, uh, some of the others are, are much more conventional through their biography. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. It's, it's it, museums can put whatever spin they want to on things. So yeah, I, I I tend to fall asleep when you when we have to start with the here's what he was at a boy speech, but it works for some people. <laughs> I kept I kept trying, and I was actually going to speak at the uh, travel and adventure show in Dallas that uh, was scheduled oh. this this April and was pushed to August, and then pushed to to next April. And I was going to drive out to uh, Midland for the the George oh. W. Bush birthplace national historic site. And in a lot of those houses, truth be told, are are, are houses essentially. Whether it's it's uh, the the Clinton one in Little Rock and these, there's not a huge amount of exhibit, but they're fun to see these little spots. Mm -hmm. I figured. I don't know anything about Lubbock other than Bobby Knight left. I'm a Big Ten guy, so when Bobby Knight oh, went there, yeah. that's all. I, that's all I ever heard of Lubbock and the Midland. I know nothing about, so I was gonna just head down that way as an excuse to uh, check it out. I can tell you, taking a trip from Dallas to Lubbock is you need a lot of energy drinks because it is a lot of flat land you're looking at. It's not a. It's not a. Uh, it's not an awe-inspiring drive. Let's put it that way. There, there are parts of Texas that are. They're beautiful, like in, in particular, like around Austin, um, there's 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 the, the, the hill country and there's there's kind of a little mini, we've got a, a pretty good growing mini region, wine region down here in, in Fredericksburg. Okay. That's great. And um, there's there are some caves around Austin. Um, there, there's just a bit more to do. And I, I'm a big outdoors guy. So that's that's in part why I want to to move down there just because it, it, it just caters a bit more to the outdoors. Oh. Almost like the live professional sports. You know the the ability to, to to go to a hockey game or go to a baseball game like fairly easily, but to be honest, I don't even know when those are returning anyway with with COVID laying around. So I might as well uh, go go down somewhere to where we can enjoy a bit higher quality of life. And I'm an avid barbecue fan, and and most of the best ranked barbecue in Texas does reside in Austin. So got it. You've got to give us your your number one barbecue pick then. It's actually it's funny. I didn't plan this on purpose, but it's uh here we go. It's Franklin Barbecue. Okay. It's a it's. It's a fairly nationwide ranked place. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart because um, you do wait. Now I don't know what. Um, sorry, I like slipped out of the chair when I did that. Um, you do. You can wait for about four hours to get into the restaurant. Um, usually, you go do it on a, a Saturday morning. You know, have a few beers in the parking lot. I don't know. I personally get. I buy. I go to Walmart. I seem to never have a. You know, one of those pop up camping chairs or lawn chairs when I need them. <laughs> I'll go to Walmart, spend five dollars on a pop-up chair, sit there, have a few beers, and and wait for the line to move. And then when you get in, it's you're you're gonna drop you're gonna drop a fair amount of money. You're gonna drop somewhere between fifty and a hundred dollars for for two or three people. And it's but the brisket is unparalleled. If you if you're I don't know if you're like a big barbecue fan, but it's nice salty bark. It's it's just literally just dripping off dripping off the fork. Like you can't beat it. There's nothing tough about it. For my money, it's 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 the best one around, and I've been to a lot of them so. Oh, incredible. And uh, another of the the uh, aborted trips that, that was I was going to tie into the show was to go down to Houston, which I, I've only ever been to IAH, which is not where the Space Center is. I was going to head no. down to uh, uh, the, the smaller airport, and then I was I was looking at the map, and I've heard jokes about Galveston. Uh, I'm not going there for five months, like <laughs> you ended up in Koh Samoy, but 
but to talk yeah. about it as <laughs> is it a spot worth checking out a couple nights a little weekend staycation or is it uh, deservedly the butt of jokes uh you mean down and around houston get galveston the uh oh, I sorry, sorry galveston it is uh boy i <laughs> i hate to insult again my fellow texans but now that i've seen real beaches with real water and real sand it is a uh it it'll work i guess if you have to do it it's a it, it will work <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty bad though it's brown the sand's not great <laughs> i don't know we have we have flocks of college kids in north texas that that fling down to um like corpus christi and galveston for spring break and it, it's probably just more of an excuse to get drunk with anything you're not going to have a lot of quality beach time but Hmm. It, I, my answer will be if you must. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of quality beach times, uh, your, your original plan for Kosamoy was how long? Um, one week. Okay. And I think many of and, us had those the one week style visits and thought we, we see somebody like the the the, the guy who is doing the uh, the the beachside restaurant or whatever, and we think, oh, what. What would that be like to to move here and, and be here for months for uh, years? Exactly. No, exactly. You, you, and you, you've experienced it without plans. So five months. What what was that like? Would you would, would you find five months again and work from the laptop by the beach? I I I would say I would tell you that I think we we practically won the COVID lottery. If we had to, I'll, I'll give a bit of a backstory if if you'd like. Um, we were in so. We did end up trip, we did end up visiting 23 countries on 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 this in within the 12 months, but you know it all came to about a screeching halt in March, and we had to make some really tough decisions uh, when we were in Myanmar. Um, we were going to go from Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Indonesia, and once I started seeing the Sri Lanka visa, um, my Sri Lanka the Sri Lanka visa was free, but it did not get approved, and Myanmar was kind of hinting at shutting down and. We kind of made a decision like I think if we're gonna go, and we're gonna get, we either have two choices: we're gonna either get you know locked in Thailand to to an extent, or we're gonna have to go back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Thailand seemed like a better play. I mean, we knew we'd been in Thailand before; we had visited Phuket um, and Bangkok, and we knew it was at least it, it would be a, it would be a comfortable place to be locked into. You know, that was our best guess at that point, and mm -hmm. we we flew to Bangkok. And it was it was pretty desolate. It was it was bad. There was about nothing to do. It was it was everyone's version of a quarantine. Like no restaurants were open. It was all food delivery services, at least the neighborhood we were in. And we said, all right, well, let's take the train down to Koh Samoy and check that out. We'll stay there for a week and we'll we'll like we'll replot, we'll replan. Um, so we stayed at a Marriott on, you know, we took the train down, we stayed at a Marriott in Koh Samoy. Really, really loved it. Um and then was like, well, let's let's do a couple more weeks, and <laughs> that that couple more weeks turned into a uh, well. Let's just make this the last month of our trip. Like, mm -hmm. let's just let's go big. Let's get a cool villa overlooking the ocean with a private pool. Let's just let's just let's just end the trip on a on you know a really cool way, and then we'll go. So we you know we kind of became non-budget conscious at that point, and uh, we did it. And then the the visa extension came through, and it just it just kept going. It was just like, all right, well, we'll go home then, or we'll, we'll jump to. Like my father just moved my just moved to Japan and we were like, well, let's go see him. And it and that was in the back of our minds. It was like, well, we're gonna move, we're gonna go to Japan. So whenever it opens up and it will, like we'll go. And it just never happened. We couldn't get into Japan. Um, the US was looking less and less attractive. So we just kept extending and extending and extending. And you know, then five months blew by and, and I, I think we hit the COVID lottery. We got we got really involved on the island with a, a volunteer group because a lot of ties were out of work and hungry. So um, I had been pursuing a bit of a side hustle with videography and photography. So I got hooked up with that volunteer organizations. And when they went out to, to pack up food and feed locals, and I went out to, you know, uh, photograph their social distancing measures and their, you know, just the general vibe of the island and just kind of show like how it affected how, how an island so fueled by tourism could be torn apart so quickly when it was cut off basically from the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a really, I think it was a really unique experience, but it bounced back fast. Um, you know, restaurants reopened, uh, bars reopened, and it was, it was literally like if, it, if, well, if you've ever been to an island like that and you thought, man, I, I wonder what it'd be like to work for my laptop from this bar every day and have a beer. Like it was exactly what it sounded like. <laughs> I would just pick up my laptop, go to a restaurant, 
sit in the sand, stare at the ocean, you know, have a beer, depending on what time of day it was. And it was literally exactly what it sounded like. It was, it was literal paradise. Um, you know, I, as we were talking about, I started working for, with Dave and Lisa and basically travel couple. And I got to make some really cool, you know, day in the life videos in Thailand. And, you know, how far can I stretch this, you know, 30 bucks. And it was a blast. And, and I can't believe how quickly five months flew by, but it was really a great experience to be a, a bit of a local. So. Wow. Uh, were you able to be productive? I mean, I feel like I'll bring my laptop on a trip like that. I've never gone intending long term, but I just feel like it's suddenly 3 p.m. and I haven't moved. And it's, you know, it's well, for the for the first few months, honestly, there was there was a real there was kind of a real true quarantine. And it was uh, there was a military enforced curfew. And you know, I had no interest. You know, I told you about the Texas infringing your rights thing. I, I was certainly not going to test Thai military or Thai government. So I followed it to a T. Um, so, you know, we were in by nine o'clock every night. It wasn't a lot of going out. wasn't really anything open. So for, and then, you know, the, the three months after that, it was, um, we, we had to have fairly productive days because we're going a little bit crazy. There's only so much, we had a private pool, but there's only so much swimming and drinking beer you can do. I mean, it, we had, had to start getting on a bit of a, a regimented schedule. So that's when I really started ramping up on the, on the volunteer work and I got hooked up with basic travel couple and, um, yeah. I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't be a beach bum all day. I thought I, I did gain 15 pounds in five months. So if that tells you anything, <laughs> that's not, that's not a great average at all. It's not great. Let's talk about this organization you got involved with. It was newly created. It was uh, just. Um, it, it was, it was not, an, it was a it, organization that had been around for, for 20 years. It was called uh, sisters on Samoy. I think, I think it was a, they were just originally kind of a um, getting interrupted by a very special guest. So. Sorry, we're getting interrupted by a special. Oh my guest. gosh! Do we? Do we? Look at that! It's me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, I'm the failure half of Wells World Tour. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was just asking us about, uh, do you want to, since you're late and you want to be put on the spot, because I know you love that, do you want to talk a little I, bit about Sisters on Samoy and what we did with them? So um, we kind of carry two different roles. So Rob went out at the very start of COVID when we got there, and he really worked hard to feed the community and get really involved with everything that was happening in the community back when people were waiting in lines to be fed and really had basic needs that needed to be met because people weren't working. And then after a few months, I joined the group and I worked towards sustaining what these people needed, which for them is growing gardens and getting um, sustainable resources that they could grow themselves on a minimal budget and then working directly within the camps of workers to provide uh, prenatal and postnatal care for mothers that were birthing in either less than ideal circumstances or moving into the birthing centers in Thailand. Mm. Oh, incredible. So, we were asking about uh, how you managed to be productive and it's, uh, I had no idea that, that you guys were doing such good and finding a way to, to totally pivot this, this incredible trip uh, into something that, uh, it's probably even more meaningful than the, the than the twenty three countries you guys dashed through over the course of the year. I think so. I mean, it was it, it, it we got to a point with with working and getting involved that we were we, I I was as exhausted some days that I'd ever been in a you know normal day of U.S. work, but it, it did give it did give a sense of purpose to the trip, and uh, I think we had an idea that we wanted to do some volunteer work along the line. It just never kind of formally worked out. And I, and I don't think we would have taken that opportunity to, to settle down and, and stay in a country for an extended period of time like that um, if we hadn't gotten that opportunity. We did, uh, we did do the Camino de Santiago, which is a, a religious pilgrimage through Spain. We did that for 35 days, but that was other than that was the most time we spent in one country. Oh, wow. So that's, that's why I've heard wildly varying interpretations of <laughs> it's the- You probably get the spectrum with us. <laughs> hey, let's, let's hear the spectrum. <laughs> uh, I would say, yeah, both of us had, had varying degrees of, of difficulty and, and experience. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed every bit of it. You know, it, it was very, it was very difficult at times. I'm trying to think how to set this up for anybody who doesn't know what it is, but it, it, it is practically, it, you, you start, um, 
on the border of southern France and you hike basically almost to the ocean of western Spain. And uh, it takes anywhere from 30 to 40 days to walk over 800 kilometers by foot. Um, it is a hike. It is a hike, but it, 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 at points it's just a walk. Um, and you're just kind of staying from hostel to hostel night to night, um, trying to carry as little weight as possible. And a lot of people do it for religious regions. Um, it's, it's a, it's a predominantly Catholic, um, experience, but all, all walks of faith and non-denominational, uh, people do it as well. But, um, I would say I, I enjoyed it probably more than she did. I think she found the, it to be incredibly, incredibly monotonous at times, but those are kind of the times that I enjoyed the most where I got to just listen to music, tune out and, and walk. And I, and I thought that was an incredible experience. So do you want to share your point of view? Um, I think like the emotional aspect of it for me was absolutely huge. It was something that I will carry with me my entire life. I really took to heart the, um, the Cruz de Ferro day, which is, if you've seen the movie, the way it's the tall cross, um, the leaving your burdens behind, uh, we left stones up there. So the emotional aspect of it for me was huge. The physical aspect of me for me was daunting i was in a lot of pain there was a point in time where um i thought i had torn my meniscus in my knee i was really struggling to walk so we took a three-day break so our hike took a little longer than a lot of people does but we had the time because we didn't have a set most people we met said oh well i fly out on this day so i either make it or i don't and that's the only choice and we kind of had the ability to take it at our pace and rob was more than patient with me needing to take a few more breaks than the average Joe does. Wow. That's uh, one of those things that is that I've, I've heard wildly varying things. I, I haven't figured out, do I really want to take it on? You know, I hear about Appalachian Trail, all of these great hikes. It, <laughs> it leads to this great insight in your life, but it could also be a real miserable slog. I guess it uh, all depends, uh, as you said, your health. Yeah. And, well, we're yeah, separated sure. from it now, too. We see it a little more... Uh, joyous then you know you kind of lose some of the brutality as time goes on and you're i look back on it now and i'm like that was great and he was like you were miserable for half <laughs> <laughs> somebody and, uh, wrote that we that we took that i was just looking at the comments and somebody asked yeah. if we took that so that is that that's the the ron savaya is, is the is the first the first time town you reach on, on the first day and the, but it, the first day is probably one of the hardest ones you do do a the better part of 30 kilometers from from southern france over the over the pyrenees mountains and mm. it is it was almost a, a it was almost broke us on day one and i you know it was to the point where i got to the hostel that night i threw my backpack i said man screw this like this sucks i do not want to do this anymore you know after after a few glasses of wine and a few beers we we had calmed down but to answer that person's question that was definitely in the evening because it was a i believe a 12 hour day <laughs> And my pack was very heavy. We told the hostel, the guys at the hostel the night before we left to hike through the Pyrenees that my pack was, I want to say 14 kilos. And he laughed at me and he said, what are you going to throw away today? And I found out very quickly that I threw something away every single day of the trip. <laughs> And speaking of that photo, you, you sent several photos, and I've seen that you, you two managed to get some incredible couples photos, which uh, my wife has certainly criticized me at times that there's very few pictures of her and I together. So how, how are you putting this together? How are you figuring out? These are not just stealthy stick. Uh, <laughs> no, that's all Rob. That's not me. No, I... I... <laughs> I, I, I did I, I told you I wanted to take part of part of this this year for me was was become learning to be a better photographer and videographer so I you know I invested in some pretty pretty nice camera equipment tripods triggers remotes stuff along that line um, and actually Instagram is a is like an amazing place place to research you know great you know good angles on photos and stuff like that based on the location you can get a, a, a lot of inspiration um, on how to do that. So it's not a, it's not all like my brilliant knowledge, but it, it definitely takes more than a selfie stick and a, and a cell phone <laughs> for sure. The one, one you sent that the, the group hasn't seen, but I'll add it to the comments is that the two of you on camels. So walk us through <laughs> what equipment and how you to, how you pulled that off. 
Actually, that one I won't. I hate to spoil the fun, but that was just somebody. I think one of our our guides was just taking that with a cell phone. That just turned out really nicely. Um, it was more it, editing. Editing was was like a really painful process to learn for me. So that was just actually a cell phone camera. But the uh, the one that you you introduced, uh, I, I think it was on like the the title slide where we were kind of on a motorcycle with a mountain behind us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one was like that one was probably an hour ordeal to take, and it was there was probably about twenty different versions of that photo, um, and it involved a a couple hour pretty pretty steep hike. And I you know I took a tripod up there, um, a trigger, and you know tried tried a bunch of different angles, and I definitely was rude and made some people wait. And it was I just knew it was like that was too epic looking of a shot to, to rush. And uh, that that's what it is about those photos. Like if, if you take your if I found if we the more time you took, usually the the much the far better result that you would get. So, yeah. And once again, Rob is the patient half of us because <laughs> I'd be like, "Are we done yet?" And he's like, "Well, you're gonna want this to be right later, so you can stand there while I figure it out." <laughs> I will tell you that the back of that motorcycle. It, it's hard to tell from the picture, but I, I mean, there was a straight plummet from the back of that bike that was kind of like chained up into the rock. So it was kind of scary to sit there. A lot of palm sweating. It was a, there was a I couldn't even tell you how, <laughs> you know, there was a seatbelt on the bike, so you didn't fall off, but it was, it was a strenuous photo opportunity for sure. And you mentioned a, a challenge of learning photo editing. So what, what software is your uh, tool of choice now? And what, what, what have you, uh, what was worth, you know, learning beyond the I'm feeling lucky button, the autocorrect button. <laughs> um, I think because it, 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 you didn't always get, you know, there, there is their rules in photography on, on better parts of the day to take photos than others. And it was just when it was, you would never, it wasn't always convenient to go out at, at dusk or dawn to take photos. So it was, it was uh, for me is Adobe Lightroom is, is just the easiest easiest software to use once learned correctly. Um, it does do a lot of the work for you if you hit the I'm feeling lucky button, but um, it's, you know, it's got, it's got all the software you need. And I think it, for me, who, or for us who, who are always on the road and always on the move, it really plays nicely between a desktop and a, and a phone where it's all, everything's essentially cloud backed. So if I, you know, if we're just about to board a flight, you know, I got to put my laptop away you know, I got a few minutes on the tarmac to, to knock out the, the rest of the edits on my phone or, or vice versa. Um, so I thought that, that I'm sure there are plenty of apps out there that, 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 that play nicely with each other between, between devices. But that for me, was just really easy to use. And uh, pr like, because we principally posted photos to Instagram, um, it was, it was easy to, to, to move photos back and forth. And you couldn't really, at the time, at least I think you can now, I don't think you could post photos to Instagram from a desktop. So Okay. Yeah, and we found that we maybe, could log in know. between maybe. devices, yeah. so we could share. Like, I could log in to his Lightroom on my device and have access to anything he had taken or edited. And if he needed to make a quick change that didn't want to drag the computer out for you, could do it on the cell phone and then directly upload it. Which I'm not. We don't really use Photoshop, so I'm not as well versed in it. But I don't think you can download as easily from Photoshop to your phone, like he was saying, to post mm -hmm. to Instagram. So there, there were times like like with that photo that you showed that I can tell you that was a that was a labor intensive editing process and it, it involved and also it goes, I don't know how much Photoshop you use, but it went back and forth from Lightroom to Photoshop, from Lightroom to Photoshop on different versions. And it that probably took two hours to complete. And it just I'm sure there are people who are far better photo editors that will laugh at me, but it was I just found that the more time you took on it, the better the result. And I, I'm proud of the work as, a, as an art piece. I'm not an artist by any means. I can't draw. If you asked me to draw two people, I could draw you stick figures with like dress to represent the girl. But like I can represent my artistic and creative side through photography. So. Oh, that's incredible. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we can pick on you in a sense of, uh, we talked about your background in Texas and, and for the international audience, you're, you're like the iconic American, right? You've got the baseball hat, you've got the, <laughs> okay. but but not all. Did you, and, and I, I think the the semester abroad is getting more common. But you said four years overseas, and that is that's rare to encounter Americans doing that. So what what got you and 
from, as I said, it's a semester abroad. People go to Paris and they come back. You, you, you spent four years. It's a, a big commitment. Well, no, that was, uh, that was just my, my, my dad would moved us over there for, for work. So we spent time, I spent time over there as a teenager, but, um, but that, but I'm saying that, that trip ultimately, even as a you know 17 year old, absolutely cha- I, I'm telling you, it just changed my life. Attending, attending an international school, uh, seeing different, seeing the way, you know, just the difference in culture in Europe. But, you know, as a, I was, I didn't care about travel. I didn't care one look about it. I think we went to like, you know, Disney World or wherever, wherever families go on vacation. <laughs> as kids, I don't remember. I think this is why we I, have kids. <laughs> Uh, I, it, it absolutely changed my life and I absorbed, I, I changed who I was as a human being just based, based on Paris alone. So, um, I think I had been wanting to take a trip like we just completed for, for ever, ever since I, I couldn't wait to go back. I didn't want to go back to America and I'm pretty sure they drug me out the door to Paris on the way out and they had to drag me out of Paris on the way back to the U S and it was just, it completely changed my life and the, in the shape of, I feel like I, you know, I'm just a more thoughtful, more well-rounded individual for the experience. And I think uh, I wish more people could do it. I know every, I know it's not possible for everybody, but like you said, I, I think the semester abroad thing is a great introduction to it. It, it will it'll absolutely change your life. Yeah. Is there a specific area of Paris, a, a neighborhood, either where you live or that you just love if you're going to park yourself on the corner cafe morning after morning? Of course, yeah, the one I lived in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was the uh, the seventeenth arrondissement, which is which is um, probably the no- I want to think I want to get this right. I think it's like the northeastern quadrant of Paris. Um, it's not it's not a touristy touristy neighborhood by any stretch of the imagination. So English is not rampant in that neighborhood, um, but you know they of course they they appreciate the effort. They try. They're, you know there's there's enough English to get around. But I'm just saying it's it's not like being around the, the district with the Eiffel Tower where I think you get a way more authentic vibe out of that neighborhood. I took her there. Um, Wonderful. She fell in love with it. I, I, I think you can, you can easily go to Paris and be like, ah, it's the most dirt, but it's probably like that with any country. Um, you, you can get it. You can get a completely different experience and, and get the more local feel if you know where you're going. So for that, for that, I'm grateful. Yeah. Yeah. I was struck on a business trip to Paris where it was, there, there was some Radisson promotion going on. So I ended up <laughs> at it. <laughs> the client was banging, but it was some Radisson that was just enough outside of the center of town that it, I, I love that neighborhood feel, and uh, it, does, it does make such a difference to just be a few metro stops away, and and uh, where you can be part part of the neighborhood furniture for a few days. So, Amelia, tell us tell us a bit about yourself. How do you you got roped into all this travel by by interest by before you two met by love uh, <laughs> when you two met? <clears throat> so. Um, I've kind of always known I wanted to travel and Rob and I connected on that immediately. I met Rob in 2013. He was my neighbor. And I think from our first date on, he told me I'm going to hike the Camino with my dad one day. And he hiked the Camino, just not with his dad. (laughs) But we were traveling together when we were broke little college kids and all we could do was drive up to Oklahoma for the weekend. We drove, I think, 15 hours one time to go to Colorado because we, all we wanted to do was travel, and it didn't matter how we got there. Um, so I've always had a bit of the travel bug, and I just met someone who really had – he had traveled internationally, and he saw the value in – and my parents have too. Like, my dad travels uh, for work, so I'd always kind of seen that from him. But being with someone who really wanted to introduce me to the – culture he had seen around the world to the to life abroad and to finding cultures that are not like your own really Mm -hmm. pushed my comfort bubble and he is always the person that's going to push me out of my comfort zone and he's going to shove if he has to to get me to try new things and to do new things and so it it was really nice to take someone like me who wanted to travel and pair me with someone who was happy to uh, like I said, push those comfort zones and get me into experiences that I may not take otherwise. And how setting aside meeting meeting the right person for for someone that that was in your position before you two met, what, how would you encourage them to 
uh, you know, we're, we're not, not many of us are traveling right now, but let's say a couple of years down the road, travel <laughs> more or less like, like where it was last year. Uh, what are the ways to convince somebody to make that, that first big leap overseas? So, you know, I, and I do get reached out from this. I'm from a small town where people see me travel and they really are like, okay, well, I can do that. Like, if she can do that, I can find a way to do that. So I do get asked a lot, like, what do you think about this hotel? And, or what do you think about this travel deal? And, and I think part of it is <sighs> Rob and I felt for a long time before we started traveling that we didn't really know a lot of people who understood our desire to constantly see new things. So for me, the first step would be just finding a group of people who have like-mindedness, who also want to travel, who want to see what's out there. People who aren't going to shut you down for feeling like you need to see a different perspective is huge. Like just having someone who, who really does support your dream to travel and makes you feel validated in it. And that's usually a group and that's so much easier in the land of social media. You can follow a hashtag, you can join on Facebook. There's so many different areas to join people who want to do it. And especially if you're afraid to be a solo traveler, you could find someone who's close enough to you or someone who's willing to make a flight to the same destination you want to go to and just have a buddy that you can travel with for a week or two, dip your toe in the water, spend your first trip for just a week if you're not sure how you're going to feel about it and then gradually build on that. And I think the there, there's this perception of cost, but uh, the, the same people that might, you know, take this weekend junket to Las Vegas and blow through a couple grand. Yeah. And think, think that the, you know, that the trip to Paris might be, or the trip to Mexico city might be prohibitive. And yet those, those fair deals can pop up for the three, $400 flight. And yeah, for and, sure. Uh, we, we don't, don't get me wrong. We, we saved plenty of money, uh, but we owe a lot of the uh, trip, probably not surprisingly to you to a lot of great points of miles redemptions. And we save those miles up and miles and points up for a long time. And, uh, I think we definitely got a lot of unreal experiences out of them, along, along with the local experiences. <laughs> yeah. It, it, speaking sure. of that, when I, when I got into Miles and Points, I, the, the part of that time when I was back in the U.S., I commuted to Atlanta for some time and then was also in New York. And even though I was ostensibly in international departments of big multinational corporations, there was always the suspicion, like, what are you doing? Why are you getting this? This can't be right. You know, you're, right. you, you know, there's just something about why why I've got these flights or why I've got these hotels. Now, Amelia, you're from a small town. Do you just not even bring up the subject, or you know, how, they they must see your Instagram feed and ask? Really putting me on the spot with that one. As I'm sitting in my parents' house in said small town. Uh, <laughs> no, pretty much people are excited to hear about it and sure like sometimes it sparks debate but for the most part people are more respectful than we give them credit for there are people who are closed-minded but that could be said for anywhere so for the most part we came home and people really wanted to hear about how it went where we went who we met like our experiences and i personally never felt like shut down or disregarded as soon as i brought up the subject of where we had been or where we had stayed or especially where we had posted up for the last six months, you know, riding the wave. It was, we were met with a lot of positivity and well wishes. Fantastic. And uh, you, you, did you say the name of the small town you're from, by the way? Um, <laughs> no, I just, I don't particularly want that on. Okay. That's <laughs> it's that's a very you're from town. Texas as well then? I'm sorry? You're from Texas as well. I am, yes. Okay, you 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 missed the whole section where we. I know I'm the. Worst I something managed to upset no. the whole class of the state, but uh, I'm I'm from Minnesota, so I said all all I knew was when Bobby Knight went to Lubbock. <laughs> you know? I'm about as far away from Lubbock as you can get and still be in the same states. So. Okay. <laughs> but there's a lot I loved in a few trips last year: Big Bend, uh, uh, San Antonio, Incredible City, I mean, really some some nice spots and and yeah. much more I want to see. And, uh, I'm curious about how you guys put together this this uh, 23 country trip. I mean, it was interrupted in the middle, but you got a lot of it done. Uh, 
you know, there's there's a lot of pressure people put on themselves when they want to have this big round the world trip. You can exhaust yourself. You can you know, just have change of heart. So many different things. What what was the plan going in? How did you do it? And and how did you change things as your interest perhaps? We shifted? had no plan. I. Oh yeah. Well, that that's the general. That's the gist of it. I I think we we, we planned no on. Plan. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, we 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 knew we were going to Paris. My parents joined us. Um, I mean, obviously, because we had all lived there together. So it was nice to revisit some old haunts, show Amy some of our our favorite places around the neighborhood. Um, and then we we planned the majority of the trip around some big Marriott redemptions. Um that we wanted to achieve that I had been saving up points for, for a long time. And we just said, you know, you know, cause we had options, as you know, like with, with points, you, we could have booked round the world tickets uh, and fair, but I, but I said, that's, that's, that's too inflexible. Let's just, let's plan the major points, know where we're going to go plan a rough month and none of it and not absolutely zero, but went according to plan. And that was great. Sure. And that was fine because we got to use, you know, you know, very low, low end carriers throughout Europe, like using, using Ryan Air, Ryan Air to fly from um, Spain to Morocco or Morocco to Italy. And, you know, we're paying just, you, as you're aware, like you're, we're paying just pennies for flights. I mean, we're paying nine bucks to fly from, um, who knows, I can't remember where it was in Morocco I now. Was, I think we paid $9 Fez. from Fez, Fez to Barcelona, which is just, you can't even get Chipotle for $9. <laughs> so... <laughs> If, if if we were if we were if we were more rigid in our schedule, I think we would have missed out on a lot. And I think that's something people say, like be flexible, but it's tough to put it in the practice. But I, I'm I'm glad we did. But the general the general gist of it was to work from west to east, um, and then we'd had some plans, and they got they you know they just got stopped in their tracks with COVID. But I think overall, there's there's no major re there's no major regrets at all. We said let's get to Asia in about six months and let's see what happens. And, and that generally happened. We just missed out on just a few countries that would have been cool, like Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And um, really, I mean, no complaints. Like, again, how cool was it to get, you know, be the resident of Thailand for the better part of half a year so? Yeah, we found home somewhere where and it should have been very migratory for the entire year. We did get a lot, we got six months of true, on the move, make friends wherever you go, keep it light, keep on the go. And then six months of like finding a community and making friends and figuring out what was happening around you. So we, I think we got the best of both worlds. And especially for this situation that the world is in right now, I don't think it could have gone better. That's incredible. And I think that's an interesting take on the around the world trip. I've I took one trip of five weeks and utterly exhausted myself and <laughs> but I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't do it again, but I just did the, the nonstop pace. So I'm amazed that you guys persisted for for six months. <laughs> and, you, and kind of, <laughs> you just kind of adapt after a little while. And mm -hmm. so for us, we had a really tough time sitting still for so long because we got so mm -hmm. used to, you know, every three to seven days we were moving somewhere new. Mm -hmm. And then we the novelty of being somewhere for a little while wore off after about two weeks. And we were like, okay, we've got to get involved in something. We have to find something to do with ourselves. It's not just sitting here, sitting on the beach all day, like, whoa, poor us. All we did was nothing, but we planned for adventure and we became, you know, stagnant and neither one of us was okay with that. So we had to find things to keep us going. Somehow Robert was separated from his Tex-Mex, but still gained a, a bit of weight, he said. So <laughs> yeah, that was that beer for him. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, I, I'm not the, and I was not, I'm not the kind of guy that would almost ever, you know, I, I very rarely get a beer with dinner, but it was like, beer is cheaper than water. I just, I didn't know what to do with myself. And I was like, well, it tastes better with beer. So, and then I, and I got on the scale and I was just like utterly shocked. Like what on earth happened? Oh Yeah. <laughs> It was probably the green curry, the fried rice, the chain. Yeah, I think I can add, I can add it all up in my head. I know what happened. <laughs> it was the Indian food for you, Mister. Can we have curry for the third time this week? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Indian yeah. food for sure. A lot of Indian food, but all in all, it was good, and 
But, you know, there's some things we're greatly going to miss about this year. But it was just – our parents really – I think any parent is like, okay, so you're traveling the world and I kind of need to know what you're doing. And mm -hmm. we were like, well, we kind of don't know what we're doing. So we'll let you know as we go. <laughs> 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 so they loved that, but they got used to it. Yeah, I think that's as, as long as it's, as long as you don't have a sudden shift in, in your communication or style, I think that's the <laughs> parents can settle in if, if they know that you yeah. know, it's going to be this frequency or this and that. <laughs> Is <laughs> speaking. Uh, you, you, uh, you said your father just moved to Japan during all this. Or? Yeah, he did. He did. He took a job in Japan, and he's. I mean, he has a probably a very interesting story as well. Um, it was. It was kind of at at the. It was kind of a sudden thing. It was like you know, let's make a rash decision. All right, but if we make this move, we got to sell our house. We got to. We got to turn around and be out of the country in six ish weeks. Well, this was at the very onset of. Of border closures and you know you know pure international pandemic and um there was no clear answers you know they couldn't get their house sold on time so my dad so my mom i'll like i'll see you later like i'll fly you out there when when the house gets sold and he he jumped ship with he, he just jumped ship and said i'm gonna go over there because i don't know what's gonna happen if the border closes i don't know if i'll lose my opportunity if they if they'll still take me and i think it turned out to be a spot on move for him because He's there now and he hasn't seen my mom in five months. He, my mom can't get out of a country, cannot get into Japanese immigration because she's a U.S. citizen. And, uh, you know, they're they're working on, you know, his company's working on a workaround for her. But that's it was it will I, it will ultimately do you the right move for both of them. But it was a very interesting story and time for him to do it. Wow, I think I think we need to have him as a guest. Japan. Is, I think you do. <laughs> it, uh, I spent a, just a summer there in college and. I lived in China for nearly a decade, and Japan has fascinated me as one that I would just love to spend at least a year living in and just be become part of a neighborhood like like you did in Paris. And uh, the, the summer I was there, I felt very lonely in a sense that I, it was some travel. There was, was a studying at a program and got to know and, and friends with different uh, Brazilian ethnic Japanese that were studying. Their parents had all sent them to study, and, and they were often ostracized or not not welcomed into the Japanese circles and they became friends. Uh, but then as I, I slowly started learning a little bit of the language and, and adapting and, and finding icebreakers to get to know some of my peers, it, it really warmed up to it. And I feel like that's one, there's just, there's such a distinct culture and lifestyle of, of that's so different than what I'm used to in so many ways that I I'd love to, to be there long enough that I, I really have to adapt. And I think that that period is probably like, like you mentioned, this long time in Paris. I felt when I was an expat in China, if, if you're somewhere less than a year, you, you sort of adapt, but you don't really have to adapt nowadays. There's so much modern communication, but it's like once you pass the year mark, then you're having to figure out residency. You're having to figure out bank. You, you, you can only go so long. Um, you know, like a Google Fi SIM card before they shut you down. I mean, these <laughs> these things. And I think that's a good good part of the adaptation is you, you you're forced into becoming a local for a lot of practicalities and you know, standing in line at government offices even can be can, can be a good learning experience if you, if you keep positive about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> we did that. Um. Yeah, I, I I would think that we did do Japan for we were fortunate enough to get to do right around Christmas time. We did Japan for two weeks, and I and I felt like we didn't even even scratch the surface. We we did get to do like the JR trains that that go that that cross the country, mm -hmm. and did a little Kyoto, Osaka, and and then the rest of our time in Tokyo. But it just I we like couldn't have even scratched the surface barely enough. And but Japan was one of those countries that we just continually make jokes about, you know. Like Japan is just the most thoughtful country with every small little innovation, you know, from from bathrooms to trains. Like it just they just they just figured it out. Everything in Japan just works. It makes sense. <laughs> it was just a it's just a really innovative, great country. It makes sense, but it's 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 so engineered to the you know, you're speaking of points, you go to the ANA or JAL website and it's a the info is all there. It's all mapped out, and you know. But it's like, which which family member can you book an award for? It's a. Uh, oh my gosh! I know. Flowcharts. 
I think the funniest thing I've heard so far wasn't even my own experience. My dad told me that in his apartment, there's a button that fills up the bathtub from the kitchen. Oh. <laughs> Just like, why? I mean, it's not a bad thing. That sounds cool. That's but fantastic. I, why? <laughs> why not? Why aren't we doing this? We are doing this completely wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. So in, in, in closing, uh, you guys are back in the U.S. for the, the time being, reestablishing your your careers. Uh, let's let's assume in a couple of years we can be traveling again. Are you guys going to be digital nomads? Are you guys going to be based in the U.S. and traveling around? What's What, what has this year taught you about how you want your, uh, let's say, your next decade to look? I, I would say that a lot of people were like, I, I, unfortunately, a lot of people said, well, hey, did you get that out of the system? And I'm like, no, I, I could have done worse. another year <laughs> easily. Now it's worse. And now I want to do more. And uh, yeah, I, I think I strive for some, some sort of opportunity to be, to be a digital nomad. Um, you know, my skills have, are, as my skills progress and, and my freelance work, I hope that gives me another opportunity to, to continue traveling and, and produce content. Um, for the road. Um, I like being a consultant, but I, uh, I like, I like traveling even more. So <laughs> that, that's my answer. I'm sure she feels pretty similar. Yeah. And I mean, truly, truly we traveled and kind of didn't know if, like he said, like if this was going to be okay, we did this year and now we're ready to be done. You know, like for us, we're like, we did this year, but what else is out there? And we missed some really key countries that Rob was really amped to see. Like he really wanted to go to uh, Sri Lanka and Nepal. He had big plans to hike Annapurna. Mm. And a lot of that, I mean, we sat in a hotel room one day and just made very jump decisions to make moves that day before the borders closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's still so much we want to see. So there's no way this is the end of the road of travel for us. So, the more migratory we can be, the better it is. Well, fantastic. What a beautiful way to close. Thank you both for joining us tonight.